In this video we are going to take a closer look at the March Deathwatch tournament results, including the games of Westeros 14, the Manchester 40k Super Major, the Southampton GT, as well as the Factorum GT. Over the course of the video, we will go through all the relevant results and lists in an attempt to find out how the Death Watch is doing in these times of apparent hardship, with win rates being at rock bottom and the promise of improvements for our faction arriving in the next balance status lay. For the final part, I will offer my personal conclusions and a quick wrap up. Welcome to Swiss Hammer, your channel for modeling in Warhammer 40k. My name is Temmer and I will be guiding you through this video. Before we dive right into the tournament results, a quick word on Deathwatch tournament attendance in general. Given the combination of a generally low player base and the current win rate percentages, it is perhaps no big surprise that the attendance remains low. If any meta chaser ever wanted to hop on the Deathwatch train, it would certainly not be now. However, having said that, I also think that this month has not been exclusively bad for Deathwatch, as we will see in just a moment. While the current top Space Marine factions are Iron Hands and Dark Angels, both of which immensely benefited from recent rules and datasheet additions, for the average player, I also think that there is absolutely no reason to lean into the bad press and shelf Death Watch for good, especially not with the next balance status laid around the corner. As I have said many times before, with such a small sample size, a single Deathwatch player attending a tournament can heavily influence the win rate percentages of that given weekend, that's pretty massive. As a result, and based on viewer feedback of previous episodes, I have focused this release on a more direct comparison between lists that work well and lists that don't. Enjoy! Having said that, let's have a look at the first tournament, the Games of Westeros 14, an event featuring 86 players over 5 rounds. Here we have a single Deathwatch player, Mikkel Klangby, going for 1, ending up on rank 9. His matchups were as following. Round 1 a win against Grey Knights, Round 2 a win against Craftworlds, Round 3 a loss against Dark Angels, followed by 2 more wins against GSC and Space Dwarfs. Looking at his list, Mikkel made significant changes compared to his tournament winning list iteration that he played throughout Warzone Nephilim. For HQs, he has the Captain in Phobos Armor, a Champak Chaplain with the Beacon, and then double Librarians, one of which in Phobos Armor, and with Lord of Deceit, and the other one in Terminator Armor. The reason for this is that he can dedicate one Librarian to a Psychic Secondary, while still using the other one to get our important Xenoperge Discipline powers off. For troops, he went with three Proteus kill teams, two of which were his signature Clangby style kill teams, and the third rocking five Deathwatch Terminators, which he can combat squad off as a very durable OPSEC unit. He then also went with double Spectrus kill teams, both running four Last Facility Eliminators, that he can pair with the Comms Array Infiltrator, and then the other four Infiltrators go with the single Incursor with Haywire Mine. The comms array over the helix gauntlet in this case makes sense, because he's running the Phobos Captain, meaning the Eliminators will always get the hit rerolls from the Captain. Good stuff. For Elites, we have a Judicior with Oathkeeper, clearly the way to run that one, as well as some Servitors, which are excellent chaff, can screen, block or do actions. To round the list up, he also brought the Vindicari Assassin. Now, we talked about this pick a bit in the Deathwatch Discord, and I think the common agreement was that this breaks mission tactics, which might be intentional or not, but I think at the current state of rules, it is best to check with the TO which way they rule it. For Mikkel's list, I think there is no real need to break mission tactics anyway, he do just fine. Either way, this is Mikkel's latest attempt to keep playing the more defensive game, even though our Long Vigil secondary is gone. 
In arcs of Omen, I think most Deathwatch players would agree that reliably scoring secondaries can be an issue, and Mikkel's answer to that is mainly going for Warp Ritual, Banners and Oath, over which he has a great level of control and does not have to overcommit any of his forces if he does not wish to. I really like it and look forward to seeing how he will be adjusting his list in the near future, and my congratulations once again to the great result. Moving on to the second tournament, the Manchester 40k Super Major, a big event featuring 248 players over 5 initial rounds. Here we have two Deathwatch players, Jonathan Patridge going 3-1-1, ending up on rank 45, as well as John Burns going 1-4, ending up on rank 224. Jonathan's matchups were round 1 a win against Iron Warriors, round 2 a loss against Imperial Guard, round 3 a win against Iron Hands, and much to my dismay, this is one of my viewers having turned to the dark side, Phil how dare you! Then round 4 a draw against Necrons, and round 5 a win against Imperial Guard. For John, his matchups were 3 initial losses against Space Wolves, Admech and Space Dwarfs, followed by a win against Craftworlds, and then another loss against Dark Angels. Looking purely at matchups and factions, I think both of them had at least 3 difficult matchups, so the difference in results cannot be purely based on that. Looking at Jonathan's list, he went the highly unconventional route, which looks as following. First we have an Acolyte as an agent of the Imperium, assumably to break mission tactics, which makes sense in this particular list. For HQs, we have a Phobos Chief Librarian with Lord of Deceit and Dvorkin, as well as an Indomitus Captain with Dominus Sieges and Vigilance Incarnate. For troops, and this does not surprise me, we have triple indomitors, Jonathan has a history for running those in numbers, one with flamestorm aggressors, and the other two with eradicators, most likely used in mixed unit combat squads. We then also have double spectre skill teams, rocking five eliminators each, one with last fusil and the other with bolt snipers. We then also have an aggressor squad, as well as two gladiator reapers. Overall, this is a very shooting heavy list, something that we don't commonly see for Deathwatch, and I think he managed to find that fine line between breaking the super doctrine to fully maximize the shooting, yet still sticking to mainly kill teams that are a main selling point for Deathwatch. Must have surprised more than one opponent with that. I think especially for people looking to go down the primaries route, this is something to take inspiration from. On the other hand, John went with a more traditional list, including a Phobos Librarian, the Indomitus Captain with the Dominus Sieges, Primaris Chaplain on Bike with the Beacon, a Watchmaster, a Forest Kill Team with Assault Hellblasters, Double Indomitors with Aggressors and Eradicators, Double Proteus with Deathwatch Terminators and Van Wets to Combat Squad Off, as well as a Primaris Apothecary. Overall, I don't think he made any single bad picks there, though the 40s and the two Proteus skill teams look a bit outdated, and that might just have been enough to tip the balance in his disfavor. Moving on to the third tournament, the Southampton GT, an event featuring 192 players over 5 rounds. Here we have once more two Deathwatch players, both going 2-3, with Robert Leeper ending up on rank 99 and Josh Clark ending up on rank 115. Robert's matchups were two wins against Admech and Chaos Demons, followed by three losses against Imperial Guard, Iron Hands and Chaos Demons. I think the trend here is pretty clear. For Josh, we have a loss against Necrons, two wins against Craftworld and Space Wolves, followed by two losses against Admech and Iron Hands. Looking at Robert's list, for HQs, he had a chaplain on bike with the beacon and a watchmaster. For troops, he went with a squad of infiltrators, three modified Costello style Proteus skill teams, as well as one Spectre skill team with five Las Fuzil eliminators. For elites, we have an aggressor squad, as well as a chapter champion with Imperium sword. To round the list up, he brought along an eradicator squad. 
Overall, I think especially on the Proteus scale teams, there are a few suboptimal war gear choices, such as a double lightning claw terminator or certain war gear on the wets, but this might simply be a modeling issue rather than picking the best available. I think anyone that did not magnetize is likely still in the process of recovering from all the free war gear changes. Anyway, comparing to Josh's list, his is far more atypical. For HQs, we have a Terminator Chaplain with the Beacon, a Terminator Chief Librarian, which could have taken a third power by the way, as well as a Watchmaster with optimized priority, the Ties that Bind and the Tomb. For troops, we have 5 basic Deathwatch veterans and 2 Proteus scale teams, which are loaded with Cyclone Missile Launchers and Combi Meltas. For elites, we then have a Chief Apothecary, as well as 2 bricks of 10 Deathwatch Terminators, all loaded with hammers, shields and the obligatory Cyclone Missile Launchers. What I personally think is missing here is capitalizing more on the kill teams, as we are currently somewhat overpaying for Terminators when compared to say Dark Angels, if I wanted to spam Terminator squads, I think I would not pick Deathwatch in the first place, and the two actual kill teams provide too little benefits in the overall scheme. Nonetheless, he certainly managed to put all the free war gear into practice. Then for the fourth and final tournament, the Factorum GT, I included this one for the purposes of showing the impact of a single player on Deathwatch win rate for any given weekend. This event had 25 players, with the Deathwatch player ending up at the very bottom, going 0-5. Looking at his list, he brought along Chaplain Cassius, a librarian not using the Xenoperge discipline, Watch Captain Artemis, an Indometer kill team with just the 5 heavy intercessors, kill team Cassius, two Proteus kill teams with mostly vets rocking some non competitive war gear, an aggressor squad, a chief apothecary without selfless healer, a squad of van vets with non competitive war gear, a van dread, a veteran bike squad which is horrendous, a storm raven gunship, a razorback and a rhino. Now, to make this clear, my intention here is not to call out the player in question, but simply to state the fact that one cannot win with this list. In order for this to happen, Deathwatch would need to be Codex freshly out through Kari level of broken, and even then I would have my doubts. While I really hope that the player in question was having a good time, and or was simply following my suggestion to initially tank the Deathwatch win rate in order to get some boosts in the next balance status late, for as long as lists like that show up at events, and they regularly do, though perhaps not to this degree of fluffy, we have no chance to recover from poor win rate percentages. But for anyone not looking closely enough, they will only see the sub 50% win rate and dismiss Deathwatch's bottom tier, completely ignoring what is actually happening. All in all, while Deathwatch March tournament appearance continues to be low, and our overall win rate percentage certainly did not increase, I still think that we can draw a positive conclusion from all this. Deathwatch regulars like Mikkel or Jonathan still managed to pull off great results. While both made significant changes to their past late iterations, I think Mikkel was taking a more classic Deathwatch approach, sticking to his signature Proteus skill teams, but supporting them with double spectra skill teams, and of course the second librarian for easy access to that third secondary we might be struggling with in Arcs of Omen. Jonathan, on the other hand, broke traditional conventions and with that mission techniques, going for a shooting heavy primaries list, which I think might be of interest especially for the newer kind of players, looking for an approachable style of list with more recent models. While close combat oriented clangby kill teams are an excellent meta pick, they also require a great deal of skill to pull off when compared to some of the more shooting oriented choices, which might be especially overwhelming for beginners. It has to be pointed out though, that both went double spectrus with eliminators, which I think perform exceptionally well in the current environment. With the balance status slate practically around the corner, I am very much looking forward to see what GW has in mind for the Deathwatch in the near future. 
To wrap things up, over the course of the video, we have looked at Deathwatch March tournament results, including the games of Westeros 14, the Manchester 40k Super Major, the Southampton GT, as well as the Factorum GT. While there have been no big breakthroughs for the Deathwatch, and tournament attendance remains low, we are nonetheless seeing some solid results from the more veteran Deathwatch players. With Arcs of Omen still being relatively new, we are also seeing list experimentation all over the place, ranging from the more traditional kill team heavy focus, to breaking mission tactics, or going heavy with data sheets outside of kill teams. Having said that, though there was a surprising absence of Dreadnoughts. Anyway, with the balance status late around the corner and 10th edition drawing near, I think I would personally wait for committing to any major investments at this point, as we are going to see a huge rebalancing of pretty much every datasheet, at least that's what GW has previewed so far. I am certainly looking forward to seeing what the balance data slate has in store for us, and what its impact will be in the coming months up until 10th edition shuffling everything anew. So that's it for the Deathwatch March tournament results, what do you guys think about these particular lists and results, and what kind of changes are you going to make to your own lists, any predictions on what the balance status slate might have in store for us, let me know in the comments. Then finally, if you made it this far and I still have your attention, if you like my content, any additional support is greatly appreciated, as it helps me invest into future videos. For that, I have both a coffee as well as a Patreon page, links are in the description. Furthermore, I would also like to mention that there is a Swiss Hammer Facebook page, where I will be posting links to my videos, as well as articles I find of interest. I do read a lot about the hobby, but not all of it will always end up as its own video. I look forward to seeing you there as well. As always, thank you very much for watching guys, your continued support is greatly appreciated. I hope you have been enjoying this video, give me a thumbs up if you did, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thanks again and see you next time.